President of the Conference, Director General, Delegates, we are here not only to celebrate the achievements of the ILO as the tripartite body that has over the years been committed to promoting social justice, decent work, rights of workers, strengthening workplace dialogue, but also to reiterate our support for the Future of Work initiative as captured in the centenary celebration. This, for me, is crucial. In the face of the report from the World Employment Social Outlook for 2019, which indicates that some 700 million workers live in extreme or moderate poverty. Out of this number, nearly a third can be found in Africa. The report reveals further the progress on the implementation of SDG number eight, which demands that we promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all is not progressing as expected. Inequality, fragility, high levels of informality, and widespread unemployment, particularly amongst the youth, continue to militate against the achievement of inclusive, sustainable economic growth. This is not right, and the time has come for the world to find sustainable, lasting solutions to these issues. I came into office two and a half years ago to discover that not only was I quite appropriately the nation's chief laborer, but also its chief employer. Why do I say so? We have a large workforce in Ghana, but the majority of people are underemployed, inappropriately employed, or unemployed. Indeed, the number of people in what can be described as formal work is a small part of the workforce of our country. The figures suggest that the size of the workforce in our country is about 13 million people, and there are less than 2 million people in formal work. Unfortunately, over the years, much of our preoccupation has been with this small group in the formal sector. Ghana has good human capital, and our economy has great possibilities for accelerated growth and job creation. In recent years, admittedly, our economy has not done so well, and it has not been successful in improving appreciably the living standards of our people. For a country that has an abundance of valuable natural resources, we have no excuse for not being able to use the blessings bestowed on us by the Almighty to bring progress and prosperity to the citizenry. Recognizing the severity of joblessness in Ghana, upon assumption of office, we have put in place bold, innovative, and urgent steps to ameliorate the situation. We've turned our back on the old economy, which was based on the production and export of raw materials, and we have embarked on establishing a value-added industrialized economy supported by heightened agricultural productivity. This is the sure way of creating thousands and thousands of decent, well-paying jobs for the mass of Ghanaians and lifting them out of poverty. That is why our first task has been to get our economy, which has been in the doldrums in recent years, working, and also create the atmosphere for entrepreneurs to bring on the jobs. We've chopped modest successes in this regard, with Ghana's economy projected by the International Monetary Fund to be the fastest growing economy in the world this year. We are now the largest recipient of foreign direct investment in West Africa. We are some of the world's largest companies setting up shop in Ghana, and we have recently become the largest producer of gold in Africa. We have rolled out the program for planting for food and jobs, which is providing incentives and boosting incomes of one million farmers. The results of this program have been spectacular. We had a bumper harvest of produce, and last year we did not import, unlike in previous years, a single grain of maize. Additionally, the One District, One Factory, and One Village, One Dam programs and the Zongo Development Fund 
and the Infrastructure for Poverty Eradication Program are all being pursued to stimulate job creation opportunities across the country. We've begun to rectify the serious neglect of skills training by modernizing and strengthening technical vocational education and training institutions. We're also tailoring the curriculum of skills development and job learning based institutions to current industrial needs, both at the enterprise level and within the job market. Through these areas of commitment, my government intends to address the long prevailing scales mismatch between majority of school leavers and industry requirements. I'm happy to inform you, President of the Conference, Director General, Delegates, that organized labor, acting through the Trades Union Congress and other labor organizations in Ghana, has fully endorsed these policies and has pledged support to assure the attainment of the creation of the goal of decent jobs for all Ghanaians. And it is a pledge that I welcome warmly. We're determined to consolidate further the relations with our social partners. On 18th April, government signed a landmark social partnership agreement with organized labor represented by the Trades Union Congress, employers represented by the Ghana Employers Association, and government represented by the Ministries of Finance and, Lab and Employment and Labor Relations. To provide a medium for building a sense of cohesion, trust, and self-management, frank and open discussions to champion the course of developments towards re realizing our vision of a Ghana beyond aid. We in Africa have a responsibility to make our countries attractive to our young generation. They should feel they have a world, worthwhile future if they stay at home and help build their nations. We should be and are ashamed by the desperation that drowns young persons to attempt to cross the Sahara on foot and the Mediterranean Sea in rickety boats in the tenuous hope of finding a better future outside Africa. That is why our efforts in Ghana feed into the African Union's Agenda 2063, a strategic framework for inclusive and sustainable development in Africa. Despite the persistent security challenges in parts of the continent, Africa is clearly doing much better than she was doing some 30 years ago. AU Agenda 2063 presents the continent with the hope and aspiration of economic transformation over the next few decades, based on the full mobilization of Africa's dynamic youthful population. We're building a stronger, more resilient, united and prosperous Africa with a well-defined cultural identity. We're embracing a people-centered development, relying on the great potential of the African people, driven by democracy, good governance, and respect for human rights. Africa is quickly turning around her fortune. The aid narrative is being changed to a focus on investment and trade cooperation. With the imminent coming into effect of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement made in March 2018 to increase the world, to create the world's largest free trade area since the formation of the World Trade Organization, Africa is set to maximize its potentials. With a market of 1.2 billion people and a combined gross domestic product of United States dollars 2.5 trillion, the CFT will eliminate high tariffs, generate employment opportunities for a rapidly growing young workforce, and harmonize the work of our regional economic communities. Before I conclude, President of the Conference, Director General Delegates, permit me to recall the relevance of the 1944 Philadelphia Declaration and the pursuit of social justice. As an organization that has successfully delivered on its mandate over the last century, despite the challenges that have confronted it, 
The issue of equal regional representation in its governance structure in the next phase of its existence should be fully embraced. The tripartite constituents are eagerly watching and expecting an improvement in the governance structure of this important organization. African ministers of labor at their last meeting in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia two months ago on 4th April were of the strong conviction that improving governance of the ILO is synonymous with the effective implementation of the ILO's responsibility in the interest of its constituents. They reiterated and sub supported the urgent call for making the governing body more representative by providing a means of appointment of its members, which takes into account the various geographic, economic, and social interests of its constituent groups. It is my expectation that the instrument of amendment to the ILO Constitution 1986 will be given a chance to feature prominently in subsequent discussions during this centenary celebration. It is also my hope that the global report and subsequent discussions that will take place will provide us with some answers to navigate the challenges of the world of work in the 21st century. Member countries should welcome the countless opportunities that lie ahead to improve the quality of working lives, expand choice, close gender gaps, reverse the damage caused by global inequality and climate change, and more importantly, also share in the discharge of the responsibilities towards a more sustainable future that guarantees that we leave no one behind. Once again, I congratulate the ILO on its centenary celebration, and hopefully we will leave the conference fortified in our belief that we can provide opportunities for all our citizens to fulfill their aspirations. I thank you for your attention, and I wish you a fruitful deliberation.